All right, let's look at another large molecule. Uh, we did two in class. We have plenty of structures on the handout that we can play around with. This one in particular is vitamin C. This line here is the same as one of these single bonds. It's just a line, but it's drawn in this fashion. So I selected this molecule for a few reasons, but one of them is just to show you a different style of drawing a bond, which would imply that this is coming out at you. So it, it just tries to impart some direction uh, to this bond, some three-dimensional sense to this to this picture. But it's done inconsistently. It's just on on featured atoms or featured bonds. So what is the first thing that you should do so that all, regardless of what you're being asked for uh, to, in terms of this molecule, um, what should you do to sort of prepare the sample um, and make sure that all the information that you need is basically right in front of you and the rest is um, can be answered simply by in inspecting what is available. So let's, how do I get this molecule to the level of inspection? The first thing I want to uh, point out is that uh, we have a lot of hydroxyl groups here and we know that this oxygen not only has a single bond to this carbon, which is something else that I want to point out, but there is a single bond, and so a line missing, let's say, there is a single bond to this hydrogen. So if I were to count electrons, Lewis acid or Lewis structure style, around that oxygen, I'd want to make sure that I realize there is a single bond here, okay? So some hydrogens are drawn in like these because they are part of these functional groups. Other hydrogens are not drawn in but assumed there as they are part of a saturation of the carbon. So, all right, so first thing, maybe not something to, to write, although it's up to you if you wanted to impose a line here, just to remind yourself, and over here as well. Um, more importantly, I think, are the carbons that are implied in these. Um, this is kind of a line angle drawing, but not really because it's not as simple as one would be. But it is making use of the feature that uh, we don't draw in the carbons because it's a safe assumption that they are there at these points of intersection of bonds. The second safe assumption for you is that carbon will always make four bonds. And now that we've done Lewis structures, you'll note that right that is carbon's expression of the octet of electrons. But carbon, we won't we won't see carbon um, maintaining that octet of electrons or satisfying it with a combination of bonds and lone pairs we will just see it satisfied with four bonds. And that could be uh, four single bonds. So here, I know that hydrogen is missing in the detailed structure. I know there are two hydrogens there. And in this case, carbon is making three bonds, apparently. But I know that the fourth is there. It's just not written in this structural representation. This carbon already has one, two, three, four bonds, so I would not add a hydrogen here. This carbon has already four uh, bonds showing. This one, um, this could be tricky now that we've done VSEPR where we count multiple bonds effectively as one pair, but when I'm counting bonds for this purpose, carbon has one, two, three, four, okay? Carbon is satisfied with four bonds here. So is this one, so is this one. So I think all the bonds except the lines to hydrogen from oxygen and all the hydrogens are showing. So I'm ready to add any pairs of electrons that might be missing. So the concept continues now, the idea of an octet of electrons. What you don't want to do is go back to the very beginning and get a simple formula, C something, H something, O something, count them all up, get a total tally of electrons and start placing them because the Lewis structure is done. There's just one thing missing. And that's the placement of the lone pair. So hydrogen is already fine. It doesn't take eight, it takes two. 
And we've just satisfied all of the carbons with their octet of electrons expressed as four single bonds. Oxygen needs an, an octet of electrons as well. And here it has two, four, so I know that there are two lone pairs to make it six, eight. And two, four, oh, six, eight. Now if you want to write your two lone pairs both on this side, that's fine, that's fine too. Um, two, four, uh, two more. So I'm beginning to see that this hydroxyl group, which was first introduced to us when we did naming of organic compounds, simple groups, actually has uh, two lone pairs and is therefore represents quite a, a negative uh, concentration of charge here of electrons and it does certainly contribute to any possible um, partial negative charge on the molecule or a polarity of the molecule but more on that later and this hydroxyl group as well because that's two four now what about this oxygen two four all right so it needs two lone pairs as well so these carbonyl carbons also have two lone pairs on them now this oxygen is part of a heterocyclic ring because it's not all the same atoms in the ring. But it has two, four, and then two more lone pairs. So this molecule has a lot, it's very electron rich here in lone pairs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So now that I have this, I can actually answer questions on or describe, let's just describe any local geometry, local hybridization state, um, and in terms of geometry I can do any local um, electron group geometry as well as molecular geometry. So let's let's try that. I wonder if I have more of a pointer here. Maybe we'll really use this as a pointer. Okay, um, let's just start with this oxygen. Um, how many electron groups are around this oxygen? I'm, I'm going to uh, not write a whole lot here. I'll let you take your notes because you have the same structure as this. So uh, away we go. What is the... Uh, what did I ask? How many electron groups are around this oxygen? Electron groups, so I want to count both the bonding and the lone pair. So there are one, two, three, four. Four electron groups around this oxygen. And with four electron groups, the electron group geometry is therefore tetrahedral. Okay, it's therefore tetrahedral. However, the molecular geometry around here is just bent because two of those sites on the tetrahedral are not filled with atoms, but rather they are uh, they have lone pairs. Okay, so in fact, this part of the molecule has an oxygen, and it goes over here to the carbon, and it goes this way to this hydrogen, and the lone pair is here. And the lone pair is here. And so, and, and this continues dot, dot, dot. So I might ask you, or you, you can certainly uh, deliver on this, what is the bo COH bond angle? This COH bond angle, because it's bent, and it's bent from a electron group geometry of tetrahedral, this is, uh, it's about 109.5. So in the lab, you probably learned that the, it's less than 109.5. The reason why it's less, it, it's just think of this in a very physical sense. Um, it's a little bit less because ideally, if all these positions on the tetrahedral were occupied by the same species, then they would be evenly spaced. But these two electron pairs kind of muscle this bond closer together these two atoms closer together and, and so it's a little bit less than the ideal 109.5. Okay, um, but you can just write 109.5 or about 109.5. However, if you were asked to rationalize why this bond angle is less than, then you'd have to be aware of the reason. This 
Uh, oh, before we get to this carbon atom, we can talk a little more about this. So this is bent, less than 109.5. And um, so now I'm going to ask you, what is the hybridization state? So I'm just going to point to that oxygen and ask you, what is the hybridization state? Again, the in order to determine the hybridization state of a central atom, at least a local central, um, we just count the number of electron pairs. So we already established that there were four. And if I have four electron pairs, then I need to combine four atomic orbitals. And that's an S and three Ps. And so it is an sp3 hybridized oxygen. This carbon is also, once, you, once you've done a few of these, you can just whip your way through a molecule identifying the hybridization state. Why is this one sp3? Because it has four electron groups and it needs four hybrid orbitals. And remember how these were formed? It took one s, three p's, and then um, massaged them into four equal degenerate orbitals, each named sp3, which demonstrates its constitution, one part s, three parts p. Uh, this carbon also this carbon is also, right, because there's four, yeah, sp3. And <clears throat> this oxygen, one, two, three, four, oh, this oxygen is also sp3. So as you do more organic chemistry, you'll be associating hybridized um, atoms with certain functional groups, but that'll come later. I see that this carbon is also sp3. Let's do this carbon. It's a little bit different. How many electron groups are around this carbon? Now remember, I just counted uh, one, two, three, four bonds to determine that I didn't have to add a hydrogen here. But how many effective electron groups are there? I recognize that there's two pairs of electrons here, but they count as one for VSEPR hybrid um, for VSEPR hybridization state because what I'm really counting are effective electron groups, and I know that there's one there's three sigma bonds right and one pi, but I have I count the double or a triple if it were a triple I count multiple bonds as one effective pair. So there's three around this carbon. And in order for three to arrange themselves in a geometry, we know that that's trigonal planar. So the geometry around here is trigonal planar. But I'm asking you, what is the hybridization state of this carbon? It needs one, two, three. And so this is sp2. Let's take a break here, and we'll come back.